I got a special guest with me today, entrepreneur, songwriter, producer. What's up, man? How you doing? L. Lambert, man. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Happy to be here. Yeah, man. So we got a lot to talk about. We know you're a busy man with a busy schedule and a busy plan. Yeah. So first, man, for the people who don't know, my audience who don't know. Yeah. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about where you're from? Man, I uh, I was born in D.C. Um, young age. My dad's a pastor. Dad's a pastor. So um, all my family's from D.C. Mom's from Maryland originally from North Carolina, uh, so I have those Southern roots. But we moved to West Virginia. My dad got a position as a pastor um, when I was a, a young, young, young kid. And uh, we moved to a city called Martinsburg, a town called Martinsburg, West Virginia. Uh, so that's where I grew up. Um, people always are intrigued when I tell them I'm from West Virginia. Um, but it gives it gives me opportunity to, um, you know, to build my... Uh, case for who I am without really having any preconceived notion about where I'm from. They're like, West Virginia, what's that about? What's the what's the vibe of West Virginia? What's the energy? What's the, you know, where does your influence, you know? So I get a chance to talk to people about, you know, different people who are successful in my state. I always get a chance to, you know, make jokes about we have bad PR uh, and how, uh, you know, just, just West Virginia was an interesting place growing up. I got a chance to um, work with some phenomenally talented people at a young age. Any of those people you want to shout out? Yeah, man. Listen, I got to shout out um, this guy by the name of Cameron Rawls. He uh, met him in high school. This dude was the first person that could hear something and tell you what key is in. Like, he could hear the phone ring. He'd be like, oh, that's, that's an A-flat. And so seeing that in high school and he could play, he was really influenced by jazz. I grew up playing in church. I grew up playing piano. I, I played drums first. I started drums at about two. Was the drummer for my dad's church at like five. So started early on the drums and moved to keys. So watching this dude Cameron play keys when we were in high school, um, you know, he bought that jazz element. He could write, he could produce, he could sing. You know, the ladies liked him. He had dreads, you know what I'm saying? But he, you know, he was somebody who really uh, influenced me as a, as a peer. Uh, so Cameron Rawls, another hip hop artist by the name of Israel Music, he was the first guy that I saw that created beats off of a Sega Dreamcast. Now this shows you like this was probably 2000 and I'm telling my age now, but this was probably 2003, 2004. And he had some game that um, he could produce actual songs on his with his remote i've never seen that before he used his video game controller and created songs and recorded records from those songs he won the talent show in my high school and everything so israel music i gotta shout him out he works for um uh, one of the big uh, uh music supply companies i forget the exact name of it but he's an engineer he did tori uh kelly studio and a bunch of other stuff Martinsburg, Martinsburg, West Virginia had a lot of talent. So those are a lot of people. I, I was 15, 16 in the studio writing with them, writing records, making, you know, tracks, making beats, making pianos, you know, you know, they, I was just, I was just so in, entranced in it uh, from high school, man. So that was really my upbringing there. Um, I went to college in West Virginia University after high school. So yeah, man, tell me about them college days, man. Do you man. miss it? What do you miss most about being in college? The freedom. The freedom, man. College was like high school with very little rules. <laughs> uh and not in a bad way, but it was just like you you had the you had the ability to you know, not have to work in the real world. Like that was the thing was like you were able to meet people from different places and different spaces. And then you um, are finding yourself in the whole, you know, during that time. And you're you're trying to see, OK, how do I establish my identity outside of my parents' house and outside of my hometown? And so um, college was great, man. I pledged a fraternity. I was over different organizations. I was the director of the gospel choir and. Uh, over the Miss West Virginia pageant for three years um, for the whole state. And 
I, I was over um, the music department for what they call the um, the Arts and Heritage Academy for West Virginia. And that's when I really saw how talented these kids are in West Virginia, how they never get the opportunities because we don't have, you know, just these these hyper-focused music programs outside of high school and ways to, you know, build those skills and this raw talent. But I saw during that program alone, some amazing rappers, some amazing dancers, some amazing singers, some amazing musicians, some amazing, you know, and these kids were 12, 13, 14 years old. Um, so, so college was, college was, you know, um, that's why I started a really successful company, um, throwing events, throwing concerts, throwing shows. And so that really kind of got my entrepreneurial So let's talk about rolling. that. Yeah. Because you said, so what's the name of your bit? What's the name of your company? So my company uh, at the time was called um, EFM, which stood for Extended Family Movement. And it was, uh, you know, I had a bunch of interns that were my age um, and we social media just came out. And so I saw that we had, you know, Morgantown, West Virginia, which I, I went to college at WV. And so um, Morgantown was predominantly, uh, you know, it was mixed, but it was predominantly white. And um, you had a great number of black businesses within this community and so west virginia university had a lot of black students we had probably at the time i was there maybe three four thousand black students and that's a lot that's a lot a lot of hbcus you know and so we had our own community and so having our own businesses in that community allowed for um us economy and so I was like, okay, well, social media is just coming out. Instagram had just came out my sophomore year. And so we were offering marketing services in exchange for promotion for different things I was doing. So it would be an artist that's dropping music or it would be an event that I need a sponsor for. Or it would be, so they weren't really paying me money, but it was commerce. It was, com- you know, I was doing their social media. We were doing their marketing. We were doing their, their branding. We were creating promotions. Like I remember one of our greatest success stories was... Uh, a barbershop um, called Classic Cuts. And what was great about Classic Cuts, number one, it was very hard to find a barber in Morgantown, West Virginia. Um, and uh, Not many barbers? What? I'll tell you this. My first weekend at school. Uh, no, no, no. This, this, I, I did a program before my freshman year, like a couple weeks before freshman year. And um, it was like three weeks and I ain't had no haircut. And so we looking around, all the guys, it's like it's like 10 guys in the program. We all black. It's a program for black incoming students. And so we're looking for a barbershop. And so we go downtown, and it's this spot called Clip Joint. You would think. <laughs> they, they cut black hair. It was, and I'm sorry, Clip Joint. But it was a white lady as soon as I walked in. And she like, we come on, come on in. Did you get your hair cut there? I did. <laughs> and I wore a hat. <laughs> we wore a hat. And that's when I got in the hats. I got in the hats real good. Um to I forget her name <laughs> on purpose, probably. But um, so I was, it was hard trying to find a and it, and everybody who went to school with me. I'm not I can't say the joke on here, but uh, everybody who went to school with me, it was a funny story with uh, finding a barber because after this situation, school just started. Still didn't find a barber. First weekend, school. There's a McDonald's right by my dorms, and this is where everybody goes after the club lets out. All the football players, and this is like WVU football. So this is like big time on TV on Saturday, guys. So Noel Devine, I don't know if you guys know about Noel Devine. Uh, you know, we had a hilarious story. I love Noel, but it was a hilarious story um, with that. But finding a barber was very hard. I'll just say that. And um, so we found a black barber shop finally. <laughs> um, and they were my client, man. And we did this. We did this promotion. I'll never forget. 
Um, and he had just gotten out of prison. It was a phenomenal story because his name, Bilal, man. Bilal, I always give him credit. Um, shout because, out Bilal. Shout out Bilal, man, in classic cuts because it added culture. This is Morgantown, West Virginia. We're in the mountains, you know, and it's 30, you know, 2,000. How many ever black students out of 35,000? You know, and so we had to create our own community. That's why we had a program for black students coming in to create a community. And so, um, man, we did this promotion. I, I never forget. I said, Bilal, you need to do $10 Wednesdays. $10 Wednesdays. Haircuts $10 all day Wednesday. We did that promotion. Line around the corner. It was never. If he ended up opening a shoe store next door. He ended up opening another barbershop. I mean, he ended up building that business. That's when I knew. I said, okay, so this creativity is just something to this, right? And so that's when I was like, okay, let me see how I can make money from this. So fast forward, I pledged my fraternity my sophomore year. Then I was a president. I was a president of the chapter. We get homecoming. We get homecoming weekend. The whole week we get homecoming. And so we usually traditionally would do this competition called party walk, stroll competition, where they would dance. It wouldn't be the stepping on the stage. It would be more dancing in a line, right, what they do at parties and stuff. So right. we did a competition. And that weekend we did the competition. We did the party. We did the after party. Man, we made it. It, it was probably thirty thousand dollars it was like amazing to see just the impact of just throwing these events mm -hmm. so then i said there's something to this because we couldn't you know uh use the money outside of the fraternity you know which was it was phenomenal but um that really got me thinking again i'm looking at social media i'm looking at marketing i'm looking at the barbershop i'm looking at other other businesses i'm working with and how i'm just inputting just a few creative nuggets and it's changing their business. And so um, fast forward, I started throwing parties. I threw a stoplight parties. I throw in birthday parties. I would rent the club out and promote a new single I was doing. I would be promoting artists. I would start throwing concerts. Um, what was your favorite venue? My favorite venue. What was the liveest one? <sighs> Okay. Memory. Okay, so I would say the house parties, man. I would say it has to be an S because anybody who went to WB, who anybody who went to Morgantown during that time knew just how epic those house parties were because it was just it wasn't the same as the club atmosphere. It wasn't the lines. It right. wasn't the drinking. Right. It wasn't the weights. You know, it wasn't the. It was just the vibe. So I love throwing those house parties. I loved being a part of those, you know, ones where you just have so many memories where you think, you know, like from that night versus the clubs were great. The clubs were cool, but it was red tape. It was, you know, other people that you don't know. It was, it was just different, you know? And so I enjoyed doing those, but the house parties, man, the house parties, I said the stoplight party was definitely the most lit. So <laughs> let me ask you this, man. So, yeah. So you moved from Virginia to North Carolina, right? Yeah. Um, Charlotte. West right? Virginia. Yeah. West Virginia. Well, yeah. Let's put it's the all West good. on the Virginia. I got I to gotta put, put the, the West way. on there. I got to put Virginia. that. Yeah, I yeah, yeah. That. I feel that. I feel that. Hold it down. Bro. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> so um, what made you move to Charlotte? Like, why, why that part of North Carolina specifically? So um, after college, got a job in D.C., um, working at a film company in marketing. Did that, left to, I was always involved in politics too, right? Middle school, student government, college, all of that. And so I did that, moved into doing my events on a bigger scale. Was doing that for almost five years in DC, worked with some of my heroes, worked with some of the people that I grew up and I was able to tell them my, how much they impacted me. I had gotten to a point where I was ready for something new. I wanted to expand. M my musical journey has taken me to where I want to remain as creative and independent as possible. 
And so I wanted to go to a place that was conducive, was fertile ground for expansion, you know? And so I started visiting cities. I was in a relationship at the time and uh, she was in entertainment as well. And so we were looking to move and expand somewhere new. And so visiting different cities, I was a part of a tour when I was still living in D.C. Um, And Charlotte was one of those stops. And I remember the vibes just from that one show, like from the audience to the food, to the the energy of the city. I was just like, this is I like it. I don't remember going to Charlotte before. Um, And I would always hear about CIAA when I was in college. I always hear about CIAA. So. Went back. um, This was 2017. Went back to Charlotte just to visit. Um. And just to be honest, it was a prayer, man. It was a prayer that I prayed. I was like, God, give me a sign that this is where I'm supposed to be. And I'm just walking around different spots. I go to the music factory. Um, Anybody in Charlotte know the music factory? That's that's, I went there because I'm like, okay, this got to be where the music is. Um, And I go to this spot and I see a stage and I'm talking to like, I think he was like a somebody who works at the at the at the restaurant and we were just networking a little bit and i just told him i'm thinking about moving i'm a musician he's like oh man you're a musician i know three pastors right now that need a musician give me your number i can link you today i was like all right bet. i was in charlotte within 60 days and so that's how i got to charlotte and i looked at how close before I moved like I'd already examined like okay how can I expand outside of Charlotte Charlotte's a great city but where else can I expand to because I love DC because you had Baltimore you had Philly you had Richmond you had New York you had all these different places but it was still so many separate communities you know what I mean it's separate almost economies that um that are very independent and I think in the Carolinas I think there's so much of a push for unity here um, that I felt like I could add to that. I can add to that. And so um, that's why I moved to Charlotte, man. That's why I moved. Do you, uh, how do you feel? Do you love it more than back home? Man. Is it a better music scene? I mean, obviously, yeah. West Virginia is a small <laughs> state. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know? Yeah. About, but let's talk about North Carolina as a whole. Man, listen. I... Because you know we we from North Carolina, you know that from North Carolina, like from 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 from, from all the way from, all the you way. know, like grandparents out here, you right. know, family. This is actually we're, we're shooting this during our family reunion weekend, yeah. and so I'm I'm very uh, proud of my North Carolina roots and my family's history. Um, coming down here, I remember uh, coming down to the family reunion, and I was. Um, I would always say, when I grew up, I'm going to live in North Carolina. Like, and I, we would be coming down here. I'm like, I'm going to live in there. I always had so much fun down here. And so seeing the talent up close and seeing how many people that are just casually phenomenal out here that you just, you would never know, right? And I'm talking about musicians. I'm talking about singers. I'm talking about rappers i'm talking about producers i'm talking about dancers i'm talking about creative minds that are even doing phenomenal things in the world um they they call charlotte home and i think that's because of how it feels so comfortable it is a beautiful city it's fast it's growing but it's still for me it feels like west virginia it's got the mountains you got the you got right. the chill it's not too it's not too crowded it's not too congested it's not too many buildings but you got a lot of people who are hungry you got a lot of people who come from other places on a mission and um and i love charlotte too cuz like that's where they discover gold like literally discover gold on on the east coast like charlotte was a big spot for gold a lot of people don't know that and i feel like that's true in many more ways than just in the ground. Just just in the ground, yeah. You know, um, and, and that's been really what has fueled my mentality of, number one, exposing the talent in the Carolinas, and number two is, like, how can I continue to 
um, expand my impact while I'm here, you know. So that's I, I super love dope. We appreciate that for sure, bro. Yeah, man, we definitely appreciate that. West Virginia, right there, you know. <laughs> yeah. So it ain't that far, you know. Yeah. So, um, let me ask you this on another note, right? Yeah. Cause I got two questions to ask you, and I'm gonna ask them both, you know, and then I'm gonna let you just go and go off of that, you know. Yeah. Okay. Um, the first question I want to ask you, right, is that do you think it's too many rappers, right? And before you answer that, right, mm -hmm. I'm going to hit you with the next one. Some people say uh, that I've heard is that, especially from the younger generations, that mm -hmm. R&B is dead. Mm -hmm. What's your take on that? Okay. So first, as far as it, are there too many rappers? Right. Um. Without asking for more clarity in, in that question, I'll say that I don't think there is, right? Because it's 8 billion people in this world, right? But unique rappers, it's not enough, right? It's not enough rappers saying something. It's not enough rappers building a unique brand. It's not enough rappers that are pushing the bounds of what rap is, you know? And so... In that sense, I think that we're still in the very early stages of what um, rap and hip hop and other genres, sub genre trap is just one sub genre from the uh, tree rap. of hip hop. Exactly. You know what I mean? Of you hip -hop, got hip hop, right. you got rap, you got trap, you got different types of uh, iterations of that. Um, and I think it's still growing. Okay, I got one more for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you think it is an age limit? I ask this question to everybody I interview, and uh, this is one of my favorite questions to ask. Do you think it's an age limit to being a rapper? Because it's everybody, you know, you got rock artists, country artists going on tours, and they're, you know, 50s, 60s, you know, yeah. but it's a washed up rapper when it comes to a 60-year-old. I have a cousin who raps in his 40s, dope artist. Yeah. But some may say, you know, something about him being an artist. I think, go chase your dream. What do you say to that? I'll say, I'll say this, right? Longevity has to be a consistent decision, right? The reason why I say that is because there's an age limit to everything, right? If you think about it, right? LeBron James is pushing that, but in a general consensus, there's an age limit to the NBA, to the NFL, to the at that level, right? And that's where it also comes down to knowing your audience, right? Because in this game, it's artists that have you've grown with them, you've matured with them, you've they've continued to speak to where you are. And then you have the artists that are trying to be frozen in time. You know, that are 40 and 50 still wearing the skinny jeans. You know what I mean? Like, that's not because that's not what your audience is doing. That's not what your the people that grew up. That's not what they're doing. That's not what they're living. And so um, I think you, you have to change with the times. And that's why I think longevity is a consistent decision, because you have to think, how is this going to feel, look, be everything in 10 years, in 20 years? How's this song gonna gonna be, you know what I mean, presented by me in a 60-year-old body? So you basically <laughs> saying think about what you're doing and, and promoting right. to the world. Right. Because one day you're gonna see a older age than what you are now. Right. And some people, some people are like, I wanna get my money and be out the game before then. Right. And so that's that as long as that's the plan. Right. And that's why I say longevity has to be. You can't think after you've made all those decisions that, OK, I need a long term career. That's why so many people are disappointed because they weren't thinking long term until they look back and realize how much money they spent or realize how much, you know what I mean, how many opportunities they squandered because the train is slowing down, you know. Um, so I think that has to always be contention on the music you make, the decisions you make, the business choices you make the relationships you have, you know. So what do you think about the the young generation saying that R&B is dead? What's your take on that? Um, I think, first of all, I would say there's, y'all know silent letters, right? I say there's silent words in that sense, and it's to me. Mm -hmm. 
I think that is really the point because if you look, it's a lot of phenomenal R&B out there. It's a lot. I mean, it's PJ Morton, it's October London, it's Summer Walker, it's SZA, it's Jasmine Sullivan. It's, I mean, it's a long list of phenomenal R&B. So I when love, you say, I personally love R&B. man, and with, so when you think, say, yeah, so if anybody, any, in my opinion, right, anybody who says R&B is dead, I automatically think to me. Because you know, you know what I'm saying? Because you could say the same thing about trap music. You could say the same thing about disco. Like, like, like they had a whole disco is dead where they rolled over the records. And what do we still we still listen to Earth Wind and Fire? We still listen to Cool in the Game. You know what I mean? And so and so I think I think good music outlasts it all, right? And it, and it's gonna live. And sometimes the younger generation has to mature and grow to really appreciate some of those songs and appreciate that music that's still there, right? And so I think that's the piece that it's like, and I think I got to shout it out. R&B Money Podcast has done a lot for R&B, right? Tank, Jay Valentine. I tell you what, I watch that show so much and I rewatch episodes, right? And I've learned, because I'm a historian when it comes to music, like, I, it's not a hustle for me. It's not a, it's not a, like, I'm just trying to hit a, li- like, y'all remember the barbers when it was six figure barber, everybody want to be a barber. No, I've been doing this for, since I was before internet, before Instagram, before YouTube, we was doing this. So seeing it at that level, um, just, just totally changed the game. So seeing the history behind some of your biggest records, some of the songs that you grew up loving, but hearing the backstory of it really gives you a deeper appreciation. Like my favorite episode, I'm going to tell you, anybody who has not seen R&B Money podcast, I'm going to tell you the first episode to watch. Harold Lilly. Y'all probably never even heard of Harold Lilly before, but he wrote Unpredictable. He wrote Take You Out by Luther Vandross. He wrote You Don't Know My Name by Alicia Keys. He wrote a bunch of records but this is his first podcast interview. And so he's telling stories. He's from Richmond, Virginia. You know what I mean? And so that those things, you know, is what gets me excited about it because you really see the R and B's very much live, very much thriving. They they did an R and B money tour. The R and B money tour was sold out all over the place. It was Tank, it was Jay Valentine, it was Carrie Hilson, it was uh Carl Thomas. And they sold out shows all over the country. You know, and so R and B R and B is very much alive. To answer your question, dope answer. Yeah, I love that. And I, I um, <clears throat> excuse me. I think the one thing that I do agree. I, well, I agree with most of everything you just said. But mm-hmm. the one thing that I did is really relate to was the fact that I enjoy a lot more music that I didn't necessarily enjoy in my younger days. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Like, I, I know music that my parents probably tried to put me on to, and I was like, man, mm-hmm. get out of here. But, you <laughs> know, in your 30s, you creeping, you know, you looking at it now like, man, I don't want to really hear none of this no you more. Gotta you gotta know live a little. Right, that's gotta, what they say. You know? They said you gotta, they said live a little more. That's exactly. what they say. They said live a little more. And that's, that's really, because some of the, you know, cause again, you see how the music some music is it's built for now and some is built to last. That's everything. So what do you think about the day's era? Do you think that more music is not built to last, which is why you have so many artists? Um, Because I you think, remember at one point they was kind of gatekeepers to who could be good and who was not. Yeah, you know, you really right. have to have a skill set. You know, if you couldn't yeah. sing, you better have been beautiful. If right. Was you know now you can just blow up however right. you want. To. Right. And I think I think um, I'm not trying to sound philosophical or whatever, but they always say with great power comes great responsibility, right? And so with great access, right? Access with the internet, access to people, access to distribution, access to merchandise, that kind of to your point, lowered the gate, right? And so the the good part about that is is that you can go direct to consumer. You can say, I want to release a song tomorrow and release a song tomorrow. Back in the day, you had to get a deal. You had to get it cut in this professional studio on some on a budget. Or, you know, you had to get prom- radio promotion. You had to get 
A and R. You had to get it approved by the label. You had to go. You had to do press runs. You had to do. If you were in Motown, you had to do artist development. Crazy, you know. And so all these different things that were preliminary. And and artists like the Jackson Fives and the Temptations, they were on the show for a few years, you know, before even getting before getting going and albums that didn't do well leading up to their success. And so. Yeah, it was a lot harder to get in the game back then. And so that's why you see that raw talent was just through the roof because you had to be bad. You had to be bad, you know? Um, And now it's like computers and technology. It has replaced a lot of the, you know, the feeling that the music had back then, you know? And so I think that um the pros and cons is that yeah you get access you can we we've we've been we've discovered so many phenomenal people through the internet and through you know being in remote areas like if it was a lot of these people like the aretha franklin's and diana Ross, they grew up on the same blocks and they grew up in detroit so if you were in west virginia and you 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 couldn't get there you couldn't even be this like you had to be within that radius many times or your family market. You like you could now you can just you grab your phone and you across the world. You know what I mean? And so that alone Good thing or bad thing. As a simple answer, as good or bad. If you had to choose a side, good good or bad. If I had to choose one, I would say good. I would say good. Um, because without it, um, we we I think we would be um, worse off because access to information. But do you feel like those people still, even those those people who um, live in those small towns, yeah. I mean, they end up going to major cities. Yeah. Like you're from West Virginia, but yeah. you move to a, a bigger city for Charlotte for better opportunities. Right. So, you know, it's still somewhat similar yeah. when it comes to that aspect. Yeah. It's like we're from a small town, you know, and like nobody's ever blew up here, even mm-hmm. though that there has been more town. Ta- I'm going to say more. There has been at least a few more talented people than right. people who have blew up. Right. You know? Right. So do you think it's just about Oh, uh, the opportunity where you go, or do you think that today you could still blow up anywhere in the world? I think it's a mix, man. I'm I'm always the one that's I, you know, it's not always it that's depends, but it's always like because there's so many variables, right? Because yeah. you have to have equal parts opportunity and equal parts prepared, being prepared, being ready for that opportunity, being ready to seize that opportunity. And then you have to be able to sustain that opportunity, right? Whether it's, okay, your song, you know, an executive loves your song, but if you don't have four or five other songs with attention span, that attention lasts for two weeks and then they're on to the next thing. And so if you don't have a backlog of songs, you're not even ready for the opportunity. You know, and so um, I think, again, the Internet, without the Internet, a lot of things would be different. You know, you know I wouldn't be here. You know what I'm saying? Like, like, it, like the Internet, like you think about everything from gaming to the Olympics to the like and you think about so many different things in our lives that, you know, without it. And I, again, I think and that's why for me. You said if you had to choose one, but I believe, and, I, and I'll say this, right, is I believe there's a duality of everything, right? Money can be used as a tool or a weapon. A hammer can be used as a tool or a weapon. Water, it can save your life. It can end your life, mm-hmm. right? And so you think about that when it comes to anything, right? It's like however you handle it is really the outcome, right? So when it comes to the internet, when it comes to social media, when it comes to hip hop when it comes to R&B's di- like everything is like it's really it can be used as a tool or it can be used as a weapon I love that answer thank you you know you always thank gotta you. you don't put your eggs in one basket you always yeah. gotta be open minded to things right and usually people just you know you know some everything ain't black and white yeah know? right so yeah let me ask you man um uh what uh, let's talk about what you do now outside of music. Um, yeah. 
I know we talked before the interview started and yeah. we was going to talk about entrepreneurship. Uh, like, if you had to get, well, before we do that, we'll talk about it at, at the end. That way we could plug it. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. You could plug all your information. Oh, yeah. And all oh, yeah. Band, bet, right? bet. So, um, if you could give some tips to my viewers, yeah, because, you know, I don't know who may view this. It may be a young, it may be old. You know, I know a lot of different people. So, yeah. Um, to my viewers, what would you tell them would be the first? I would maybe t I guess I would say tips to, you know, be successful starting a fresh business. OK. Number one, research. Um, Most times they always say and I always I, right now and I'm thinking about writing a book about this later on about cliches that we really say we don't really understand. Like we say, I mean, like that's just a cliche and we don't even think why it's a cliche, right? And so it's like, they always say you put in the cart before the horse, right? They always say you put the cart before the horse, right? And you realize if you, like, take a second, right? And visualize how it's supposed to be and then imagine the cart and the horse behind it. Right. Just imagine that. Right. And so now apply that to your business. Right. Apply that to anything for real, but apply that to your business, to your question. Right. It's OK. So number one, what is it? What do I want to do? Two is who else is doing it? You know, who's doing it, not just doing it, but doing it well. Like who is the one that is. um whether it's financially, whether it's marketing, whether, and you can have a hybrid of, you know, this Megatron of influence, right? For me, I'm like, I want to dive into the who, what, when, where, why, right? So it's like, for me is once I know, okay, what I want to do, who else is doing it well, right? From there, then you look in now, one of the best resources we have is artificial intelligence, Right. And that's the chat GPTs or the Gemini's or the co-pilot. Shout out to Microsoft, um, you know, where you're able to input an idea and get an entire plan built for you. You can edit it. You can change it. You can do whatever. And that allows you to use to leverage technology. That's where the, you, you're able to leverage these things. Right. Like you're able to say, OK. Say you want to start a, 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 a sneaker cleaning business, right? Just to say, I want to do a sneaker cleaning business. First thing I do, I think abstract. I don't even want to think about a name right now. Let's think abstract. Like what I want to do, I want to clean shoes. I want to have shoe cleaner. I want to do maybe shoelaces. Maybe, you know, like, I, okay, this is okay. So who? next thing I do is I Google the top 10 shoe cleaning businesses. Right. Top 10. Then I start looking at their social media, their website. I start looking at their brand. I start looking at revenue, whether they're making money. I start looking at the backgrounds of the founders. Right. Were they did, were they in, in the sneaker game or did they transition? What did they do? Did they whatever? So now I'm looking at, OK, this is what they're doing. This is how their, their Instagram is set up. This is how their website is set up. OK. From there, I go to chat GPT. I go to Gemini. I'm saying more, I'm going to say them all. I'm going to say ChatGPT, Gemini, Claude, Copilot, whichever one you want to use, you input, how do I build a successful sneaker company? You just type that in either one of those. It'll take based on research. This is what you should do as a sneaker company. Okay. Write a business plan for my sneaker company. It will write you a business plan. Write a business proposal for an investor because I need $20,000 to get me some equipment, to get me some cleaning equipment, to get me some marketing. I need to pay somebody to run my social media or to build, make, make me some flyers or to do some ads, right? So you can use Copilot, you can use Ch Chat GPT, you can use Gemini, you can use those to, to build your idea out because the next thing you're going to do is you're going to have to have a business plan, right? Whatever you want to do, you got to have a business plan. You got to map out where you want to go from there, you know, like I said, who, what, when, where, why, how. And so after that, then you start to think about execution. You start thinking about timelines. You say, okay, for me, I'm somebody who's addicted to checking things off the list, right? So I think about, okay, well, 
whether it's if it's just, we go back to the sneaker cleaning, it's like, okay, well, got my name. Right. So you think about your name, you think about all the legal stuff. It's a lot of legal stuff that I wish I would have known starting out. Right. As far as registering your business as an LLC. Right. And making sure that you do all the logistical things, having an EIN number, having a, you know, having having the the legal, having a business bank account. Start looking into business credit, looking into ways to, you know, utilize the resources that are available to entrepreneurs, the tax benefits, the write offs. You can write off your you know, gas mileage, you can write off your meals, you can write off, you know, equipment purchases and all these different things. Um, and one personal, uh, you know, endorsement I have to make is for an organization called SCORE, right? SCORE is in every city, everywhere. It's, it's funded nationally by, federally by the Small Business Association, SBA. If you look up SCORE in your city, then it will come up, right? Score is totally free and they give you business tutoring, business mentorship, business assistance, business advice. And that's marketing, that's branding, that's building your business. That's, you know, anything that you would like to do business wise is totally free. It's funded by the government. Not enough of us know about it. It is called score. That is another amazing resource to build your business from there it's really just hard work right it's brand building it's reading i'm I'm talking about books leadership books whether it's if you're talking about having a staff then you're reading leadership books on how to work with people how to you know the seven habits of highly successful people or how to win friends and influence people or your 48 laws of power these different books that are leadership driven rich dad poor dad you're starting to you know see what successful people do Right. So you look on, you know, YouTube and now you're starting to watch podcasts. You're starting to look at, you know, sneaker cleaning podcasts and new products or how to how to white label your own products. And now you're looking at, OK, well, now I'm not only cleaning with other products, but now I'm cleaning with my own products. Now I got a whole e-commerce business that's separate from me cleaning shoes where now I'm selling shoe cleaner across the country or I'm and now I got shoe cleaner. I got I got shoelaces. I got a uh, waterproofer. I got all types of products now that I've built a brand off of now based off of that, you know, I did. I just want to start a sneaker cleaning company, but that's where you put the car before the horse because that's before I've ever cleaned a shoe. That's before I've ever cleaned a shoe, right? You thinking about that because now you can clarify your vision of, okay, well now this, the end goal. So what I got to do today, right? So, okay, start my social media, get my website, pop, get my, you know what I'm saying? Now you got, okay, now I got to meet people. I got to see, okay, how can I get clients, family and friends? Hey, you know, you, you know, you see the, and, and, and you see how you start to get excited by it. And that's why I encourage people, don't quit your job until you are making enough money in your entrepreneurial business. Don't just jump out there and quit your job. Because what you want to do is use that job to fund your business. Use that job to create the stability to be able to pay your bills while you're building a brand, right? Because then you'll look at, okay, well, sneaker cleaning, it's not bringing me any money this month. Then, okay, I get five clients. Now that's paying my phone bill, right? Okay, now I got some clients. Now I got some referrals. I got Next thing you know, that that's an extra $1,000 a month, right? So now you're looking at, okay, if my expenses are, and this was the real math, this is What I tell people when I consult and things like that, it's like, okay, you know, you're ready to leave your job when you're able to comfortably pay your expenses on a regular basis, right? From your business, right? So if your expenses are $3,500 a month, you got to be making at least that consistently. And I would say at least three to five months before you even consider leaving your job and then having a considerable amount of savings. Right. And I'm I'm talking 10 to 15,000, especially nowadays, like you got to have a good amount of money on the side for that in between time because no business goes from zero to 100. You think about Coca-Cola, they sold less than I think they sold less than 100 bottles the first year. You know what I'm saying? Like it, it was something crazy. So it takes time. And that's where a lot of us don't don't realize that it takes time to build anything it takes time and that's years and that's you're not just going to wake up and have a six-figure business you're not just going to wake up and be making ten thousand a month you're not going to wake up and be you know but you gotta 
start somewhere. That's not, I'm saying these cliches, like you, like you gotta start somewhere, you know, and a lot of people, they just thinking, okay, well, how, how am I going to make six figures with my sneaker cleaning business? Man, just get five clients first. Just get, you know, figure that out because then you're like, okay, well, shoot, I got these five. Okay. Well, how can I turn that into 10? How can I turn that into 20? How can I, how can I get some of, you know, these young kids off the street and start cleaning sneakers where I can just focus on getting new contracts. Now I'm cleaning the sneakers for University of X, whatever, they basketball team. Now I'm cleaning they they basketball team, they football team. They, I got I'm just securing contracts. Now I'm the CEO, right? And this is what I learned. This is the last thing I'm gonna say as far as business is concerned. CEO in our community. We just hear the word CEO, right? I hear this abbreviation. For us, a lot of times it stands for you think it stands for chief executive officer. A lot of times it stands for chief everything officer. We want to do everything ourselves. We want to, but that's, again, longevity is a set of consistent decisions. And you've never seen anybody do it alone and last. You know what I'm saying? And so you see that in the grand scheme of things, it's like, okay, how can I utilize my resources? How can I utilize this time spent, how can I utilize um, the people around me? How can I utilize the internet to to build something that in 20 years is worth something, you know, that I can retire from, that I can, and, you know, and, and that's really, if you look at going back to the chief everything officer piece, right? If you shift your focus and say, Okay, I don't need to clean a thousand shoes. I need to get a thousand shoes in the door, right? So now it's like, again, you can employ people. So your focus shifts from cleaning shoes to getting contracts, right? Because that's the chief executive officer. And I tell people, executive, the root word of executive is what? Execute. It's execute. Like that's what, that's what executives do is like execute. Like, it's not about doing everything. It's focused on getting the job done. You know, a lot of times in our business, it's sales. It's getting new contracts. It's getting new opportunities. And then you get, you know, you have other people to do the work or you have other people to work with you where your energy is not all spent on just doing the work, you know? And so uh, hopefully that wasn't too drawn out. But like, when you talk about wanting to build a successful business and build a brand, just to recap, Think about where you want to go. Just sit sit and imagine. Think about what you want it to be. From there, see the successful people. See who's doing it well. Examine what they're doing. Their social media, their their offerings, their prices, their all of that. From there, use artificial. I, I tell you, because I manually had to build them before. <laughs> it was a lot of work building a business model canvas and a business plan is daunting but now you can just put it in one of these ai platforms and they'll build it for you and you can say nah change this or do this and that's okay cool do that they'll never be like come on man you like so you can it's like you're having your own assistant that won't get mad at you you know what i'm saying they like you know, that's their job so it's like build me a business plan build me a six who are the top 10 x how can i be x in you know like whatever it is just put it in there you know, and so I implore people to do that again before you even clean a shoe, before you even do whatever it is that you want to do. You know what I mean? Think, think about, about the it. Plan. Think about the plan because it's going to make the execution that much easier because you're not you're not trying to figure it out so much because the because it's like this. Is the last thing is they say get specific on the destination, not the details. Right. So be specific about where you want to go. But it's not always so much as far as how you get there, because it may be you know, twists and turns and it may not be, okay, I perform in front of this crowd and an executive is here and I get signed. It might be this person hears my music and their friend or their cousin is an executive and they hit me up on social media. Like it could be that. And so if your mind is only on, well, I got to do all the shows and you don't focus on social media, you don't focus on, then you you might miss the opportunity. But if you focus on the destination of, I want to be a successful artist and I want to be signed, no matter how it comes, it makes the opportunities that much more vast in your mind because you're not thinking it's just this one thing that has to happen 
for me to get there. It's this is where I want to go. So hopefully that that makes sense. Hey, viewers. Yeah. If he if, if, if you don't know what you need to do, it's going to be your fault. Yeah. I mean, he yeah. just broke it down to you mm-hmm. brick by brick, you know, mm-hmm. for to all my street guys listening to him. This go for you. Yeah. For all my Especially. for my all my young kids that may be listening. This mm-hmm. goes for you. For the for the woman out there trying to start her hair and her nail business, this right. goes for you. Yeah. 100%. That's a message for everybody that anybody, even including myself, could take in. Yeah. So it's up to you to take it in, man. It's been a dope interview. Yeah. Um before we go, man. Tell them how they can find you. Yes. Um. Tell them about uh. We if, bef- wait before we go. We ain't gonna hit it off yet, right? Yeah, now, yeah, yeah. I got one more thing to okay. talk about, right? Okay. Let's talk about your producing and your production, because that's really why we got here, got yeah. you here, you know, yeah. for the music, you know. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's talk about your producing, man. Yeah. Like, um, um. Is there anything that you knew you finna have come out? Is there anything <sighs> special, man? Yeah, so this project that I'm working on now is called What a Feeling. And that's really how it's going to feel when it comes out. <laughs> because I started it, um, I started this project in 2014, 2015, uh, writing songs. I was actually an artist manager. To fast forward, I quit music for some years um, and fo- as an artist and focused on managing artists and I wanted to have my own label and wanted to do things uh, on the business side of music. Um, but in that process, I started back recording music, started back recording. I wrote I wrote this song called Nothing to Say with the guy Cameron and some other people. Um, that song did really well, but I just kind of, you know, rode the wave of performing. I was performing and I was a working musician. Um, fast forward to now, um, I'm back in the studio working on new music. Um, I got demos of songs from that time and now um, that's going to be a part of this project. Songs that um, really describe my personal journey, right? It's called What a Feeling because um, it, it really is comprised of different emotions, right? You have the the classic R&B breakup songs, but you have the neo-soul storytelling songs. You have the ballads, you have the I even have an instrumental track, a bonus track called A Month of Sundays. It's going to be on What a Feeling. I got a song, um, like an Afrobeat song with this artist by the name of Foon Show. It's a title track called What a Feeling. Um, he's a Nigerian artist, phenomenal Nigerian artist. And so um, I'm excited now because I'm recording the final versions of these songs and uh, producing um, phenomenal music with different artists um, and producers such as Karen Poole. She wrote my new single called You Got It, um, wrote and produced it. Phenomenal. Um, I got new music coming out with this artist by the name of Kurt Keys. Phenomenal artist, producer, top tier. Um, De Jour out of L.A. Phenom- like I'm saying, these are immaculate artists and musicians and writers that I've gotten to be a part of this project with me. So I'm really excited about it. We're dropping the first quarter next year, but we're getting ready to start releasing music here soon. So I don't have official dates yet for singles, but just know it's coming. Dope, man. Yeah. Yeah. And let them know where they can find you. Yeah. Let them know. Uh, drop your social media. Actually, yes. you know what? You only yes. got to do that. I'll drop it in the description Boom. so y'all can go find that in the link. Yeah. Um, we'll drop everything there, man. This has cool. been a dope, dope interview. Thank you. Thank we you We finna go, so we finna get to some yeah. music anyway. Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. We'll holla at y'all in yes, peace. Sir. Thank you. Peace.